You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Each week, Cheryl will feature and discuss the many challenges of those living with disabilities, along with the various issues that are faced by their families that are caring for them. So now, please welcome the host of Courage to Overcome, Cheryl Jennings. Welcome to tonight's program. This is Cheryl Jennings, your host with Courage to Overcome, and I am very delighted that you chose to spend some time with us tonight and to learn about a new person that is on our radar that I absolutely had to have come on our program tonight, because we're going to share a story of a policeman and his wife and the courage that they've had in the years that he has been a a cop. And I'm telling you, to, in today's world, we just need to be more thankful for the people who are first responders and those who are out there protecting us and taking care of things when we have anything that goes wrong, they're the people that we call first. And there are a lot of stories of people who are not happy about cops, but you know, that's something that when I was growing up, those were our heroes. We looked to policemen, to firemen, nurses, doctors, as the people who were just going to be at the top of the list. If you could be one of those, you were a hero in life. And I still feel that way. I feel like the people who are out there taking care of us, protecting us, and helping guard our safety are people that we need to respect with all of the gratitude that we've got. I live in a town that's full of military people, and I am very grateful for those who protect my freedoms and fight for us to keep our United States free so that we can enjoy life living without the fear of someone coming after us all the time. But when we do have those times that we are in trouble, we call that 911 number, and we expect someone to be on the other end who will come and help us, whatever the reason is. And we have a story tonight of a, a time that a policeman was in the California area, and I want to introduce his wife, Vanessa Hunter, because I've known her for several years in a different setting. And when I saw that there were uh, some stories going on about her husband, Brad. I just really was very interested and in, was beginning to pray for that family to know that they have gone through a big ordeal. And yet I see the strength, the courage, and the absolute wonderful character of this family and how they have gone through such a long period of time of of trying to heal and get past a bad incident. But I don't want to spoil the story because I want to first introduce Vanessa. And Vanessa, welcome to our show tonight. And just tell our audience a little bit about what you do personally. Well, thanks so much for having me on, Cheryl. It's a real honor to be here with you and your audience today. Um, so I have been in the network marketing industry for a little over 20 years, and um, I'm now a marketing consultant to the industry, and I've been doing that, um, well, since the day Brad got hit. <laughs> that was my first day of my <laughs> new job. <laughs> so oh so uh, I'll never, I'll never oh. forget what day it was. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I know that you have been involved in helping people, and you really do reach out and you help people become the best, either them or their companies become the best at what they're doing. So I appreciate you for that. It's always good to have people that are 
giving you the information to become better at what you're doing. <laughs> and I know you have a dog that you absolutely love too. So I'm glad that you have that companion there. <laughs> I actually have a couple of you. them, so yes, I am a dog lady. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, tell us a little bit about what happened the day that you got word that something had happened to your husband. Just, if you will, go back to that time. I will, Cheryl. So I was, like I said, a few hours into my new job. I had just... Um, I had just resigned from my job um, and started my own business. So I was embarking upon my own business as a marketing consultant. And I was three hours into my new job, new day. And um, it was the day after Father's Day this past June, so June 2017. And um, I was, like I said, on the phone and uh, doing business. And I got a call. A friend of mine called me. And at first, because I was on a business call, I ignored the call and she called right back immediately. And so I knew that something was going on. Um, I just I just had a gut feeling. And so I switched over and answered the call. And um, and the words I heard (laughs) were, please listen carefully. He's conscious and breathing, but you need to get to the hospital right now. He's being taken there by helicopter. And so oh, I just wow. remember feeling it was like an out of body experience in that moment. And I just couldn't believe. And I, and I started yelling, you know, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And she said, it's Brad, he's been hit. And I didn't know in that moment, whether he'd been hit by a car or hit by a bullet or what. Um, I just knew that he was out there, you know, doing business as he usually does. Um, he's a motor cop, and so I thought, okay, I'm I'm not really sure what's going on here, but I've got to get to the hospital immediately. And and Cheryl, if I can just frame this up for you a little bit, this was a a what I felt was another blow. And the reason I felt it was another blow is that I had lost both of my parents in the previous two years. So um, my parents were both diagnosed with uh, cancer in 2014. I lost my mom in 2015. I lost my dad in 2016. And here this was 2017. And oh. I just thought my head was spinning. I thought, how, how sure. could this be happening? You know? Right. Oh, oh my goodness. It was a, uh, yeah. To lose your parents and then have a call like that. Well, go ahead. I've got goosebumps right now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, you can imagine it was it was just shocking. I thought, you know, Brad had been really um, strong and and my rock and my pillar throughout the dealing with my parents and their illnesses, and um, and I just couldn't imagine, you know, that something was going to happen to him. And so I drove to the hospital. I I I literally jumped in the car as fast as I could. I didn't even have proper shoes on or anything. I went to the hospital, and which had been a drive I had done hundreds of times before with my parents throughout their both of their um, bouts with cancer. And so um, it luckily, it was only a seven-minute drive for me, and I got there, and I actually got there before Brad got there. Even though he was being life-flighted in, um, he was coming down from Oceanside down to La Jolla, and I just had a short drive. So um, I arrived there and um, asked about, you know, if he was there. I was sure he was, but he wasn't there yet. They took me to a room. It's, you know, when you've been through um, trying times or you've been through times like I had with my parents and spent so much time in the hospital, when they said, we'll take you to a quiet room, that was a trigger for me. I just thought, I I don't want to go to a quiet room. Good news never happens in a quiet room for me. (laughs) So I just, I, 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 and I understood what they were trying to do. You know, they were trying to give me privacy and, and media was, you know, going to be involved in that type of thing. And I understood what they were trying to do, but at the same time, I just, 
I, I had never had good news in a quiet room. So anyway, went to the quiet room. I knew that I'd be able to hear the helicopter land because I had listened to it hundreds of times before um, while sitting there with my parents. And so I just waited for the helicopter to land. And coincidentally, if you believe in coincidence or divinely or however you believe in such things, a nurse came out to talk to me from the trauma center and um, she, and I recognized her, but I couldn't place her. And and I've lived in the community for a long time, and I just thought it it must have been a nurse for one of my parents. And it wasn't until my sister arrived a few minutes later, and she recognized her, that I realized that this lady's daughter had been at my niece's birthday party, and I had spent a good deal of time with her um, on a project we were working on for the birthday party. So it just was one of those serendipitous moments where I thought, wow. oh, good, mm -hmm. at least there's somebody here that I know, somebody here that I can trust, you know. And she was incredible in, you know, telling us when Brad would be arriving and, you know, when there were other traumas coming in, that a hospital is very, very busy. There were other traumas arriving. She was really good at saying, look, that's not him. Don't worry. You're going to hear a lot of commotion, but it's all okay. And so um, just to have that friendly face made a huge difference to me. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That would be a terrible time to be left alone and just sitting there waiting and trying to think through anything when you got a call like that. So how long was it before he got there? I don't know I'm, because I totally lost track of time. It seemed like a very long time. Um, my sister arrived and some other people arrived. It seemed like a very long time, um, but it, I'm sure it wasn't, you know, I'm sure it was minutes. Um, and then when he arrived, they let me go and see him and, oh, that was a shock. That was just shocking to see him in the state that he was in. And they had pulled his um, motor boots off him and they had taken his motor helmet off him. Um, but his eye was, one of his eyes was completely swollen shut. He had, um, his leg was absolutely enormous. It was swollen just beyond comprehension. Um, he had bruises and scratches and scrapes all over him. But I think the thing that, that struck me the most was that he had blood coming out of his mouth. And I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, that's a brain injury. Oh. That, oh. It, that's, that's all I could think. And, um, and when I tried to speak with him, he had about a 10 second memory. So he asked what happened and I told him what happened. And then he asked what happened again. And just, you know, he obviously had a brain injury. So that was just incredibly uh -huh. traumatic. But actually, he tell us what happened to him. So he had he been had hit pulled a car as it over. turned out. Yes, he had pulled a car over. He was doing a routine traffic stop. He pulled someone over. And while he was asking for the license and registration of the gentleman, he pulled over for just just a license plate violation. It wasn't any big deal. Um, but while he was speaking with the gentleman, he pulled over another um, man in a car at the stoplight across the street from where he had pulled uh, the other guy over, uh, basically came through the intersection. He was sitting at the stoplight. When the light turned green, he came through the intersection and aimed his car toward Brad, accelerated his car and hit Brad um, as he stood on the side of the road. Oh my so goodness. It was oh my crazy. Goodness. So witnesses, witnesses said that in, in fact, the man that was getting, you know, that had been pulled over said he looked down to find his driver's license in his wallet. And the next thing he looked up and Brad was flying through the air down the street. Oh my goodness. I, you know, this is a story of something that happens that you never want to hear anybody deliberately doing. And we have a world now where we are hearing of things that happen to people. And it's it's sad that we get used to hearing tragedies so often that people don't really pay attention sometimes to 
uh, a particular person. And that's why I'm glad you're here tonight so that you can share this, because I know that I know the outcome. And I, I want people to understand that when our policemen are out there doing their jobs, they've literally put their lives on the line. And I've talked to enough mm-hmm. of them to know that this is one reason why so many of them actually end up with PTSD, because every day that they go out there, they don't know if they're taking their lives in their own hand. And there are so many times mm-hmm. they can walk up to a vehicle. They don't know if somebody's going to pull a gun. They don't know what's going to happen. And then when this happens, it's kind of out of the blue that you didn't expect the car. You're thinking something can happen when you walk up to the car that you stopped, but not somewhere else coming at you. Uh, Vanessa, this is just an incredible opening of this story. And I just want to tell people that, you know, this is the 90th program on Courage to Overcome. And right now our show has been picked up by iHeart Radio. And if you want to listen to the program later, you can go to iHeart Podcast and look up Courage to Overcome. And this would be number 90 on the the programs. And every week we try to feature something that we can say, this is a story that you need to know about in order to have hope that if someone else can live through some of the challenges and the huge problems that face us in life, that if you're going through something, just focus on seeing that other people can make it through there. And we want to offer the support that we can to help people to understand that hope is there by just knowing and understanding how other people deal with some of the problems that come to them and learn how to pace yourself and learn from other people what they did that would help you also. We're going to go to our first break. And when we come back, I'm so delighted that Vanessa is going to be able to stay with us and give us a little bit more information about this. We'll be back in just a moment. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Oh, okay. If you're like me, you just can't wait to hear more about what has happened. We have such a vivid seeing this in my own mind. I can just follow her story of what happened when Brad, the policeman that has been on a motorcycle, has pulled someone over, and here comes a car that just sends him in the air. And to get a call like that, Vanessa, and to be told, get to the hospital right now, even if you're told, okay, he's he's alive, is still it's not enough uh, to calm your nerves down. But tell us a little bit about 
what happened uh, as they started looking him over, what all was wrong by broken bones or whatever? What kind of trauma did his body go through? Well, it went through quite a bit of trauma. We used to say he was the man of steel, but now we say rubber coated steel. Um, he had um, <laughs> he had a head injury. You know, he had a concussion. Um, he had his eye was damaged from the um, microphone that he wears on his police helmet. It had gone up into his eye, so his eye was swollen shut oh. from that. Um, as I said, he had the blood trickling out of his mouth, but there wasn't any damage inside his mouth. So I'm not even sure to this day where that, what that was all about. Um, he had all kinds of bruises, but the main thing that I saw was his leg and the thing he kept complaining about was his leg. So as I said before, he was on a 10 second loop of what happened to me, my leg hurts, what happened, my leg hurts. And, you know, it was just very um, disturbing to see him in that, just in that state. And so they had called in a trauma surgeon um, who correctly diagnosed him as having compartment syndrome. And from what I understand about compartment syndrome, there are several compartments in your leg, I think four compartments in your leg. And if any of them swell too much, it can literally cut off the circulation to the, to anything below it. So, um, oh. so they needed to go in and do immediate surgery so that they could uh, save his leg. And it had fractures in several places. Thank goodness that he did have his motor boots on when this happened um, because it kind of held things together. Um, but he had several fractures in his leg, in his tibia, fibula, and his ankle. And so they went in and immediately took him into surgery and uh and did hours of surgery um and of course i was waiting in the waiting room and again it's one of those things where you just i had bad anchors because of what i'd been through there with my parents and when i walked into the waiting room and it was the same waiting room where i'd been told that my parents you know were not going to make it separately that they both um you know had cancer and it was just one of those things that i just thought this has got, oh, I cannot my. get any more bad news in here. You know, I have to have, so we actually moved to a different room. Um, and again, I was just, I had, I'm, I, I wouldn't consider myself religious, but I would consider myself full of faith and spiritual. And I had had someone come in um, immediately. I had clergy come in and, and pray with us before Brad went into surgery. And that's all I was doing is sitting there, you know, praying and hope, praying that the surgeon was skilled, praying that he would survive, praying that, you know, they'd catch the guy that did this. And, um, and at that point, I didn't know that it was intentional. I thought somebody, I thought it was a hit and run. I thought somebody, you know, had accidentally done it and just panicked. And um, it wasn't until later that I learned from the witnesses um, and of course from the news coverage, but the witnesses clearly stated that they saw this happen. It was an intentional act. Somebody intentionally aimed the car at him and accelerated toward him. And, um, you know, all of the witnesses that were there had the same accounting of what had happened. So luckily wow. um, the man that, the man that hit uh, Brad had, he didn't get very far. He um, he ditched the car around the corner from where it happened, and he ran towards the train station. There's a, a commuter train station nearby, and but it, the problem was he was on an industrial. Well, the problem for him, the very fortunate thing for us, is that he was on an industrial road where he was picked up by numerous security cameras from all these businesses on this road. So they pretty much tracked every step of the way, and he was caught within, you know, minutes of this happening. And, um, wow. and he couldn't deny, could not deny that it was him driving because he was on video and he couldn't deny that that was his car because Brad's radio was still sticking in the smashed windshield of the car. Wow. Oh my so, goodness. I can't imagine that. 
Right. Wow. So, I, you know, from that standpoint, all of the things were in alignment for, you know, for him to be caught and, and you know, processed and put through the court system. And um, as we're sitting there, you know, this whole story is unfolding on the news as we're sitting in the waiting room waiting for Brad to come out of surgery. And when he did come out of surgery, he wasn't conscious. They had put him in a medically induced coma because of the swelling in his brain. And um, so he, you know, although he came through the surgery, he was completely unconscious and and. We didn't really know, you know, when he'd wake up or what his mindset or his, his state of his brain would be when he woke up. So that was that was very, very scary as well at that at that time. Wow. Does he have other brothers or sisters or family that were close to you that live close? So we had uh, we've got two daughters one um is at the university of pittsburgh and the other one lives in la i immediately notified them and um and tiffany came down from la and and was at the hospital she made it by the time he was in surgery so she had not seen him since it happened but she was she made it down before he came out of surgery. Um, his sister drove out from Arizona, and his brother drove down from Costa Mesa, California. Oh, well, I'm glad that you had somebody that could come and be with you for a little bit. What about your other oh. daughter? So, yeah, she was getting updates, you know, by the minute as things unfolded, but um but it's not easy to get from Pittsburgh. We think it's just a flight, no. but it's uh, <laughs> a little more complicated than that. And and so we were keeping her updated of of what was going on. And then um, and then I had my sister there, and that was just incredibly important to have that family support and to have someone there that knew exactly what I'd been through and and was going through it with me. And also our law enforcement friends, the the friend that had called me to notify me of what had happened, she was there at the hospital. And we have another very, very dear friend who was there. So all of um, Brad's friends and and my friends just rallied around us. And, And I can't tell you how important that is for a family. When you're going through what you're going through, just to have people there, even if you're not talking, even if you're not, um, you know, I wasn't exactly in a chatty mood, but to have them there and to have them just be a, a physical support to me as I was waiting for him to come out of surgery was incredible. And it, it, they were there the entire time he was in the hospital. We had people there with us the whole time. How long was he in the hospital? So he was in the hospital for um, almost two weeks. So he had the surgery and then he was unconscious um, for a couple of days. And then he came to and uh, was able to be transferred out of the intensive care unit. And we were transferred to a private room where we were for another uh, about a week. And then he had another surgery on his leg because they had had to open the leg up um, for this compartment syndrome. They had to open it because the swelling was so extensive. And so he had a, another surgery about a week later to close up the parts that they could close. Um, but part of it was so swollen still that they had to do a skin graft um, from his upper thigh down onto his uh, calf so that they could close up that wound that was still open. So they did a skin graft, and um, wow. he was in for another week after that. Wow. Well, I, you can tell he went through an awful lot, but I'm sure when he got home, he had a lot of therapy and had to go through a lot more because of that. And I just, I know that for what you said about family being there to have a support Mm -hmm. system, no matter what you're going through is so critically important. You know, this is one thing I try to help people understand that if you don't have anybody close, get online, let's find a support system for Mm -hmm. you because no matter what your problem is in life, 
it's going to be easier to handle it when you have someone there that can say, I'm here with you or I've been there and here's what helped me. Maybe it will help you or maybe not, not trying to make you do something, but to just say, I'm here with you. I'll go through it with you, whatever it is. I appreciate your candid, you know, just telling us all the things that have happened here. We need to take another break. And when we come back, I want to hear a little bit more about, what happened after he leaves the hospital. So we'll be back in just a moment. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran-owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C., Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interests through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Okay, well, this has been so exciting to just hear the story, although it is not a happy story to know that somebody would deliberately run down one of the officers that's trying to do his job. But I just want to find out a little bit about the person that did this and if you ever found out any motive about what was behind this and why would somebody just deliberately mow down anybody. So we did find out a little bit about it in the preliminary hearing, um, which happened about two weeks after Brad got out of the hospital. Um, We went to the preliminary hearing and um, this was a young guy. You know, our daughters, we have two adult daughters who um, at the time were 26 and 27 and he was 26 years old. He'd been arrested numerous times for numerous crimes, um, but he was actually out on bail when he hit Brad. He was out on bail for a felony assault rifle violation of his parole, which obviously he'd already been in prison. Oh. He'd been out on parole. He, so he violated his parole and then got out on bail and then hit Brad. So it was it was a slippery slope for this, this uh, kid. But... Um, in the uh, when he was arrested, they did a special operation where they put him in a cell um, with a confidential informant and with an undercover officer, and they struck up a conversation with him. And as it turned out, he had a real aversion to police, um, obviously because of what he'd been through and because of his numerous arrests and his life of crime and and the fact that he was um, dabbling in drugs and gang life and things like that. He, um, he obviously had a very, a distrust and a hatred towards um, police officers and in particular towards middle-aged white police officers. And um, 
Brad fits that description, although he doesn't like to think of himself as middle aged. <laughs> so, so <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so we learned that in the in the um, court case, we learned we learned a lot actually. We learned um, a lot about um, it just his mindset and and the skewed way in which he viewed law enforcement and and the world in general. And it was it was an eye opener for me to look at somebody who had obviously a very very different background than I had. Um, but to look at these two people who could not be more different, Brad is, he's not just a cop. He's a very good, good cop. He's a good guy. And he has spent, you know, his whole life protecting, um, people and, and he's a, a Taekwondo instructor and he's just extremely disciplined and just a very well-rounded, very honorable person. And then you look across the aisle in the courtroom at this total maniac of a guy who who just made wrong choice after wrong choice after wrong choice in his life and you know a lot of people would point to that and say oh well he didn't have the same advantages in his upbringing and things like that and and all I can say to that type of thing is there are a lot of people who have disadvantaged upbringings childhoods and um, they don't make the same choices that this this person made. So I think that the way you approach life is all up to you. And some people do have advantages um, over other ones, but I think at your very core, you are either going to turn things into a, a positive direction or you're going to turn into a negative direction or a life of crime as he did. So, but I think that's, that's all to do with the person, not necessarily the circumstances. I agree with you. In fact, I was just reading something this afternoon about Tony Robbins and his upbringing with um, his mother was just horrible mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. abusive and even kicked him out of the house. And yet, you know, he was able to make something of his life, even though, you know, she kicked him out with a knife. <laughs> uh, and you, don't, right. you look at people who are successful and you think, well, they never had to go through what I've had to go through. But that's you don't know that. And there are people who have good upbringings that end up in trouble. And there mm -hmm. are others who have bad upbringings that become very successful and a lot of what I've done is try to encourage people who have any kind of a disability to try to overcome it the best that you can to make the best out of life mm -hmm. that is possible for you and to support them for that. Because we do need to encourage other people to do right and to, to try their best to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. So what happened in the court with this, by the time you got to the end of it, did he end up going back to jail? What What's the story about that? So we had the, the trial and um, he was convicted of attempted murder of a peace officer. Among other things, he had, like I said, the weapons violation and other things that escalated his sentencing. But he, um, was sentenced to 28 years to life. Wow. Well, I, I, you know, he doesn't need to be out there and be able to do this to anybody else, you know, and he could be hurting his own family for that, you know, as far as that's concerned. Tell me how Brad has handled all of this. What is his mindset and has he been able to get back to work and when what was this light for him coming out of it? Well, it's amazing, really. I, you know, when I told him, when he came out of his coma and he asked what happened and I told him what happened and, I, I mean, briefly, I didn't go into great detail. I just said somebody um, somebody hit you and while well, you were doing a traffic stop and he said, his exact words were, he said, he did it on purpose? Wow. There are some oh. crazy people in this world. <laughs> so oh that was his goodness. reaction. There are some crazy people in this world. And he's seen, you know, he's seen the best of life and the worst of life in his position. And um, he's always tried to, you know, treat people fairly and with respect. And he's always done such an amazing job at that. Um, 
that it was really, that's what was crushing over this whole thing. You know, when you think about bad things happening and, and good things happening to people, there there are no rules when it comes to that. We're all dealt a deck of cards. It doesn't matter if you've had a good background, a bad one, if you're a good person, a bad person. We're all dealt what we're dealt, and we just have to deal with what we're dealt. And that is exactly what Brad did. He he just had this, obviously he was incredibly grateful to be alive and had it not been for his motor helmet, um, as numerous people testified, he would not be alive um, had he not been wearing that helmet. Um, wow. But he just, he was very grateful to be alive, but he was also very, very determined to get back to work and to the job he loved you know, protecting the, the community that he loves. And so that was a big deal for him. And that's what kept him going through all kinds of physical therapy. And uh, you can't even imagine how many appointments, doctor's appointments, physical therapy appointments, and the hard work that he did. The minute the doctor said he could go to the gym, he started going to the gym. You know, he just had an incredible attitude about the whole thing and an incredible determination to get back and, as he puts it, end his career on his terms and not somebody else's. Wow. What a statement. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of people would not feel that strongly about going back to a job where you've been <laughs> injured like that. But yet that's something that I imagine there are a lot, a lot more policemen that are that would have that mentality than would give up or they wouldn't have gone into something that was that dangerous to start with. You know, they would have chosen a different occupation where they weren't out there. But throughout all of this, you were right there by his side. How are you dealing with all this? How has it impacted well, I, your life? To be incredibly honest with you, the day he went back to work, um, not when he, he first went back to work and he was put on light duty. And then the day he was allowed to go back and ride his motorcycle, I was a wreck. And uh, I'm usually a pretty stable, even keeled person, but there was, it was just an incredibly difficult day for me. And one, and, and one of those days where I sat, I have this, um, you know, quiet room and, and I've got a picture of my parents in there and I, I was just in tears and I just thought, you know, I've held it together for all these months and now he's gone back to work and I can just, I can, I, the emotion just came bubbling out and I just couldn't, I couldn't help myself anymore. I mean, I wasn't feeling hopeless or anything. I was just feeling like, wow, this is, this has been a very long it's road to recovery. Lot. Yeah, it was eight months, right, right. and that's a very, a very long time watching him deal with, you know, the pain, and he's still got issues to this day. He's got, you know, he's back on light duty again just because of, of the fact that he went back to work and he put on 30 pounds of equipment, and that irritated his knees and irritated his lower back and, you know, caused some additional problems for him. So he's back on light duty now. But, but that day, as I sat there, I watched him and that was the hardest part. His dream was to get back on that bike. And frankly, that was my nightmare. <laughs> and so oh, it was yeah. a struggle to, <laughs> to put my feelings aside, you know, and to put everything that I felt my my worries and my insecurities and my fears. And I had to put that aside and be happy for him as I sent him off that morning. And, um, and then when, like I said, when I came back inside, I just kind of lost it. <laughs> so, well, but if you hadn't, that would be, you know, you would be having some problems internally from not being able to express some of those feelings, you know, that just, it's just part of life. We've got to let it go sometime. And that doesn't mean you're weak. It just means, you know, you've reached the point that it's going to come. You're just going to have to cry a little bit. To, and, and to build on top of what you have already experienced with your parents was an awful lot right. for you to deal with. And when you go through a lot of things, one thing after the other, the stress level just gets to be so big that if you don't stop and have time for yourself, a lot of times your health breaks in some way too 
And during this time, mm-hmm. you were trying to start a new business. So <laughs> I don't know how you could hold it together to do all of that. <laughs> That's amazing. <I> was. <laughs> and and that was, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. That's, that's all right. And that was the difficult well, part was will. the fact that I was trying to do a new, start a new business. Yes, I know. It's just an awful lot to deal with. Well, we're going to take one more break, and then when we come back, uh, we'll have a few things that we'll ask Vanessa. But I'm so glad you're with us, and we'll be back in just a moment. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is, in fact, a symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Dupula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Well, if you're like me, you have really enjoyed getting to hear Vanessa's story and tell about her husband and how courageous he is to be one of the ones that's out there protecting us and yet having been injured on the job to go right back out there and to show the courage that he does. And for Vanessa, for you to show all the courage that you have in going through being right there by his side, having a new business to take care of, having just lost your mom and your dad, you show a lot of courage and you have so much to offer people. I can imagine your business is going to be exploding now because people are – they're drawn to someone that they know has gone through a lot and you've already got all the years of marketing business behind you to be able to, to know what success is and how to help people achieve that. Tell us just a little bit more about what you plan to do in the next few months. And then if you would like to tell people how they can reach you, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you um, for this opportunity, first of all, to, to speak about what Brad went through. And um, and when things like that happen, as you said, it's a whole family affair. You know, I, I went through what I went through. Our daughters did, you know, all of his friends. It, it wasn't just us. We recognize that. But it was awesome to have the support that we had. Um, I, I, and I think for me, you know, when he, when he went back to work and I thought, okay, I'm going back to work now. And that was, that was what was so shocking about that first day was that I literally was crying my eyes out. And I thought, well, this is my opportunity to get really get back to work. And here I am crying. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But then, you know, and I recognized that I probably needed to talk to someone about a little grief counseling or something. So I did go and talk to a counselor who, who told me the best advice I could have received, which was have a little self-compassion, you know, stop judging yourself. I was judging myself because I had been strong up until that point And I felt like 
you know, sitting in a puddle in my, in my quiet room and crying and, and, you know, crying to my parents picture and and saying, where are you two? Why aren't you here? (laughs) You know, I, that wasn't, I felt like that was probably not a good thing. Um, but, but as my counselor told me, that is exactly what you need to do. And you need to have a little self-compassion and stop being so judgmental of yourself when you're going through trying times. It is essential that you get in touch with those feelings. Otherwise, like you said, it can manifest itself in health problems. You can have PTSD. You can have all kinds of things. If you don't, if your body is dealing with a stressor that your mind um, neglects to acknowledge, that is what results in this disconnect between mind and body and eventually spirit. And you end up having all kinds of problems. So I got past that and, um, and then just put my head down and started working. And I had been working while Brad was recovering. Um, but it allowed me, you know, him going back to work allowed me to go full force into building my business as a consultant. And, um, I've been incredibly blessed with some amazing opportunities, some some business connections. It seems like one connection just leads to the next, which leads to the next. I have not had one minute of downtime since uh, since he went back to work. I've been incredibly busy. Um, I'm helping various companies with uh, branding, with product development, with compensation plan alignment, and business strategies and all kinds of things to to help them get on the right track and and that's that's what I love doing. I love the fact that I can help people whether it's individual people get on track with their individual business goals and that's something that I I still do. I still do a lot of mentoring and business coaching and things like that. But then to be able to apply that on the corporate side because I have corporate experience, I can help these companies, you know, Cheryl, sometimes we're a little too close to our own company or our own um, product to know how things are being perceived or how our brand is being perceived by the rest of the world. And um, and so it's nice to come into these companies, and a lot of them are brand new companies that I've never, ever spoken with before, and to be able to come in with a fresh set of eyes and help them see themselves through my eyes or through their consumer's eyes um, and be able to course correct and adjust their marketing accordingly. Wow. That sounds amazing. And I'm glad that you're able to get out there and to do that because you have a gift for doing that. I've known you before with what you were doing previously. And I have a lot of respect for you for the, a positive spirit that you give a company, and I know that you can do that. Uh, I don't want to run out of time. I do want you to tell how people could reach you if they're interested in getting in touch with you to just be able to talk to you. How would they be able to go about doing that? So I'm I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. Probably the easiest way is um, Instant Messenger on Facebook if you just message me. It's uh, facebook.com forward slash Vanessa C. Hunter. And um, you can find me there and um, and message me. I'd love to hear from your listeners. And there's so much, um, you know, I'm not unique in going through the journey that I went through with Brad. Um, people face challenges all the time. It may be a different kind of challenge, but There are challenges that come up in life all the time. And uh, the important thing is our mindset and the way we react to the challenge, not the challenge itself. That's absolutely right. And one of the things that I try to help people when they're going through a problem to see that it's your attitude. And that's the only thing you can control. Sometimes things happen but you can't change Mm -hmm. what has happened. You can't go back, but you can't go forward either. You've got to be where you are and you've got to just look at the possibilities, but then you have to either accept the fact that this is going to be something that makes you a better 
stronger person mm -hmm. or it will make you a bitter person that, that no one's going to want to be around. And I've been around people who are very negative and I just don't like being around them. And sometimes they're family mm -hmm. and you don't have the opportunity to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to be around that person. But, <laughs> but for you to plan on saying, I'm going to make the best of what's happened. And that's really important mm -hmm. because we are coming up against times where children have disabilities. They at birth, a lot of times we're surprised that a child is not healthy, that something went wrong mm -hmm. during the process of them being in the womb or at birth. Or we have children with diagnosis that we just don't want to face. They have cancer. They have leukemia. They have all these terrible problems that are out there. But we can't be strong enough to take care of them and help them through that unless we make up our minds that we're going to make the best of what it is. And then the next thing is to learn what lessons that you, what have you gone through? Mm -hmm. What did it teach you? So that you can then mm -hmm. share that like you've done tonight to share that experience, to help people understand how can I make life better? What did I learn that would help the next person whose husband is maybe going to be injured as a cop? Can I be there to support them? Can they see in me that I was able to hold it together enough to be able to support my husband and to be able to keep the family together? And Vanessa, we have so many people that run away from problems these days that I can't stress mm -hmm. enough that just you're staying together, supporting him, giving him what he needed at the time he most needed it is tremendous. And for you to support your daughters and then for you to be there for your parents was just amazing. And I just want to wish our audience, you know, that if you have any kind of issues like that, you need to get in touch with me. Feel free to do that. Cheryl Jennings at gmail.com or through Bold Brave Media. Just look up Bold Brave Media, Courage to Overcome. I look forward to visiting with you next week. And remember, tonight's program is number 90. And I'm so excited. Thank you, Vanessa, for being here. And I'll see you all next week. Thank you again. You've been listening to Courage to Overcome with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Be it Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or autism, listen each week for an informative look into the lives of those challenged by these and other disabilities today on the next episode of Cheryl Jennings' Courage to Overcome. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.